How shall I destroy it, your majesty? Baroness Zaradnik Stone held no surprise, hesitation or eagerness. I'm suspected that if he had told her to attack a world-class enemy, she would have rendered the same response. You may choose the method, he told her. I'd like a demonstration of your capabilities. Beside him, Shiltia stirred. If I may, Ein Summer, allowing her to choose her own methods will most likely result in a boring fight. Is that so? Ludmilla is much like Aura, in that sense. She'll pursue her duties and any orders you issued to her in the most prudent and no-nonsense way possible. Her priorities lie in the completion of her objectives, and she's not one for being flashy or drawing out fights. If someone barred her path, she'd dispatch them while they were still introducing themselves if she could. Definitely not someone with good karma values, I guess. He turned his attention back to the Baroness. Out of curiosity, how did you plan on defeating this wyvern? Since it's inside a building, I would have laid traps all around the top of the tower, then burned away its wings with fire arrows. The only way out for it at that point would be crawling up the walls, and the traps above would thwart its attempts to escape for a while. If it wasn't dead from arrows by the time it triggers all the traps, it should be close to it. I have this flight item that you lent to me, so I'll be able to kill it from out of its reach after destroying its ability to fly, regardless. Schult ear was right. There would be little to see if she went about killing the wyvern in the way described. Aura wouldn't use traps since she had her pets, but the result would be just as one-sided. The method you describe is indeed a strong demonstration of your capabilities, he said, but I had something more along the lines of a conventional fight in mind. As a ranger, you do have ranged attack bonuses, but I believe your true specialization lies in melee combat? That is correct, your majesty. Then let's go with that route. The Baroness nodded in acknowledgement, then turned to scan their surroundings. After a moment, a weapon appeared in her hand, one that stood out far more to his arcane vision than what was normal for magic weapons in the region. Wait a moment, he said. Where did you get that weapon from? Lady Shiltia bestowed it to me, your majesty. Using it would defeat the purpose of this fight. Your other weapon is sufficient. Baroness Zaradnik unequipped the glaive. He wasn't aware that the natives could use quick swap crystals up until this point, and produced her regular spear. As she walked off, his gaze slid over to Shultia, who seemed to grow pale somehow. I, I received your permission to create a weapon back in the spring, she explained. It was for Ludmilla. That's a bit overpowered for someone of her level, don't you think? Even a wyvern twice her level would go down in one good hit with that thing. But anything less would look so shabby, as a noble of the sorceress kingdom. She should look suitably impressive, yes? Then why not start by filling all those empty equipment slots and replacing that crappy armor? Or so he wanted to say, but the fact that Baroness Saradnik had received anything at all from Shiltir was a step in the right direction that he didn't want to dissuade. On multiple occasions, he had shown how open-handed he wanted the NPCs to be towards useful, loyal subjects, even as far back as their subjugation of the Lizardmen. Despite this, only a bare handful of the NPCs had picked up on his cue, to most, outsiders were unworthy of even the least of Nazarick's treasures. He wasn't even sure if they would even offer them a hard-boiled egg from the tenth floor buffet. Going for a more balanced look should be better, don't you think? I agree, Ein Summer, Shelter replied, and I tried, but Ludmilla has this whole sense of humility that has her refuse anything that she thinks she's unworthy of. It doesn't help that even mid-level items are seen as legendary treasures by the locals, aren't you? There were exceptions, but the reactions of the people he interacted with were generally the opposite when it came to items from Nazarick in his experience. They would audibly swallow and their eyes would light up with greed or longing. Those unaware of his identity would even try to forcefully obtain what they saw for themselves. From rogues attempting theft to corrupt officials abusing their authority, the locals, like the humans of his original world, tended to possess a shameless greed. Ains frowned as he watched the noble woman walk around one of the zombies nearby, examining it carefully. After a minute, she stopped behind the zombie and her foot kicked out to collapse its knees. She silently pushed it face first into the ground and locked off its head with her axe. Once she confirmed that the zombie was dead, she rose and looked around. When she saw that nothing else reacted to her attack, she moved on to another zombie. It's like she's clearing the area before fighting the boss, but it is that really necessary? 
The skeletons and zombies standing around the ruins were all most likely under level 3. The ghouls were at most level 4. The whites probably topped out at level 6. She was being too careful, and this was coming from someone that considered himself cautious. Those with scouting skills in this world could sense the relative strength between themselves and their targets at a glance, and people with extensive combat experience also had a certain feel for things. The oppressive pressure emitted by the strong, killing intent and all manner of fantastical things were real here. The workers that had invaded Nazarick merely laughed when they saw the low-level spawns coming after them on the first floor, destroying them without a care in the world. Was the difference between them and her due to the gap in their professional experience? Or was it the prudent nature that Shiltia had pointed out? Pardon me. Baroness Saradnik skirted around them, walking up to a skeleton standing a few meters behind. She reached out with her gauntleted hands and popped its head off. You were, brutal. It felt like bullying, someone ganking harmless lobies with impunity. The Baroness caught the falling body of the skeleton, gently laying it down on the ground. Do you intend to clear the whole castle? He asked her. Everything is fairly close together, your majesty, she answered, so yes. Fighting this wyvern is sure to draw attention from the surroundings, and there are several hundred undead here. Since zombies and skeletons don't make much noise, I figured I'd start with them first before figuring out how to dispatch the ghouls and whites. Is there some reason behind how meticulous you're being? The adventurer training area should use undead opponents as well, so you should be familiar with these. The noblewoman yanked the head off of another skeleton, then stopped to consider his question. I think that, after a while, adventurers hold a certain mindset for their sessions in the training area. Though Lord Mayor has been refining his work, the fact still stands that each session is designed with certain objectives in mind. As such, the adventurers in training don't treat it as real, but rather as an exercise meant to test their skills and martial prowess. They aren't wrong. Everything falls within certain expectations, and there is no such thing as an unbeatable course in the training area. But the real world is not so accommodating, as those on the Azalizia expedition discovered. I see, since you believe that anything can happen in a real situation, you approach things as carefully as possible. There is still a range of what I consider plausible expectations, but yes, that is the idea. I've never been to the Katza Plains, and my experience with the undead and the areas that they reside in is limited, so those expectations are fairly broad. She paused to consider something, placing a hand on her hip. I suppose there are also the considerations that result from my upbringing as a human frontier noble. Undead are both tireless and relentless, and many can inflict debilitating conditions to the living. As one who leads many, I not only gauge short-term outcomes, but the long-term risks for actions carried out by myself and those under my command. If you win a fight, you're still left with the aftermath and how it affects your ability to achieve your objectives. Injuries, disease, poison, and many other things will add up over time. You are immune to any of the debilitating conditions here, plus you regenerate. The risks represented by our surroundings seem negligible. From what we can see, yes. What I was concerned about was one of these undead belonging to an Elder Lich and that Elder Lich flying into fireball me through this mist. I should be able to deal with one Elder Lich if it's a weak one, but not a wyvern, hundreds of the surrounding undead and an Elder Lich. Admittedly, it was a tactic familiar to him. Leaving summons out as sentries to warn of the approach of other players before they arrived at their farming location was something he had done often in group play. Once so informed, they would set up an ambush for their ambushes. Finding an Elder Lich was one of my objectives in coming here, he told her, so I'd actually like for that to happen. Um, not your getting fireballed, but having an Elder Lich appear. You have no worries in that event, I'll take care of it. The Baroness nodded, then turned to head up the street. When she arrived at the ruins of the wall, she reversed her spear and smashed one of the skeletons there. The crack echoed over the surroundings, followed by the clattering of bones over the broken paving stones. All of the nearby undead converged on her position. As expected, the Baroness came out of the pile of undead unscathed. The few scratches she took from the claws of ghouls and whites closed shortly after she had received them. She stood quietly as her last opponent fell, alert for the approach of anything new. Irons flew over to settle on a section of ruined wall nearby. Easy, hmm? Yes, your majesty, but my spear probably disagrees. She held out her weapon. 
Since she had been using it as a quarterstaff for a good part of the fight, the wooden haft was covered in chips and gouges. You haven't considered purchasing a magical weapon? He asked, any damage one takes will repair itself until the item's durability runs out. I have Lady Shiltier's glaive for when I'm carrying out my noble duties, the Baroness answered, but I've been looking for a weapon appropriate for adventurer training, at least I was, until I became undead. Why would becoming undead stop you? I haven't participated in any training sessions since it happened, as it's sure to reveal my undead nature. My party will see any visible injuries regenerate. Worse yet, I may receive a significant injury and get healed on top of that. Ains winced internally. This had happened to him more than a few times at lower levels, and that was with people knowing he was undead in advance. So you're worried that people will discover you've become undead? Yes, your majesty, the baroness turned her gaze downwards. It's strange, when I was human, I gave little thought to how others perceived me. As undead, it seems that I never stop worrying about it. No one else knows about this? Countess Corlin does. Nobe too. There's also the dragon that I accidentally injured, she figured it out from my weak scent. Nobe wouldn't care. A dragon probably wouldn't, either. Did something bad happen when Countess Corlin found out? No, your majesty, she replied. If anything, things have become even better, but she's my dearest friend, and we've been together since we were little girls. I do not believe others would handle the fact anywhere near so well. If this goes on for too long, Eins told her, they may think you've been purposely deceiving them when they finally find out. Since the person that you're closest to already knows, others may interpret your actions as your lack of trust in them. The Baroness frowned worriedly at his words. I hadn't considered it that way. I'm not saying you should tell everyone and anyone, he told her, but there should at least be more than a handful of people with whom you think you can entrust this information. I'll have to think about who I can share my new state with. I don't think it will include the entire Adventurer Guild, but I suppose I should start shopping for a new weapon again. Merchants have started bringing magical items to Erantle again, he noted. As an adventurer, you should have access to some dwarven equipment as well. Pole arms are not popular with adventurers, spears especially. Merchants prioritize what they believe they can sell for the greatest profits. She tilted her head and thought, tapping her chin with a finger. The restructuring of the Imperial Legions might result in some sort of surplus. Maybe I can get a few for cheap. Her voice trailed off as she went to destroy the next batch of undead. Heinz bonded her lines of thought. In many ways, she did not act like a noble. Using her authority and connections to get what she wanted appeared to be outside of her consideration. She was closer to an adventurer in this sense, hovering around markets and chasing rumors in an attempt to secure crucial equipment. They could just craft something for her. She was important enough, both to the Sorceress Kingdom and, more importantly, to Shiltier, that she should have the appropriate protection. It wouldn't do for her to die, no, according to Pandora's actor, she had already died several times. He wanted to find out if she had the obnoxious self resing trait of revenants from Yggdrasil, too. It didn't have to be anything extravagant, something on the level of the weapons he had just crafted would do. This world possessed several useful enchantments that didn't exist in Yggdrasil, but as far as combat equipment was concerned even a level 30 item that Pandora's actor slapped together as Amanoma Hitotsu would be on the level of a national treasure. If what she said was true about potentially matching her adamantite ancestor, what they could come up with should at least be enough to allow her to escape from a deadly situation. The Baroness continued clearing the ruins. In the end, she carefully gauged the aggro distance of the undead closest to the tower, attracting them to her by raising a clamor. Unfortunately, no elder liches arrived to investigate their missing minions. With her preparations completed, she fished out a fresh spear and loudly tapped the stones at the base of the tower. A guttural trill reverberated out of the remaining half of the keep tower. She kept tapping until the sound of a large body clambering up the wall could be heard, its scales scraping over the stone. A clawed wing hooked the rim of the tower, followed by another. A draconic head on a long, serpentine neck appeared, arching over to look down at the source of the disturbance. Gay, I should have asked what kind of undead wyvern it was. When it came to how the corpses of once living beings were converted into their undead versions, several options existed. The caster, or whatever was raising it, applied a template that modified its corporeal form. 
Skeletons and zombies were the most common example of this. What poked its head over the edge of the ruined tower was a zombie wyvern. By raising a corpse as a zombie, the hit points of the base creature were doubled, its physical strength given a bonus and its physical resilience increased. They also, of course, had basic undead traits applied to them and natural weapons and armor were retained, though not supernatural weapons and armor. The downside was that zombies were slow and clumsy. Since they were also mindless, a zombie retained none of its former life's combat experience or any spells, skills and abilities, including passives like regeneration, that it had learned as a living creature. Unfortunately, the stronger the base creature was, the more the downsides to raising a corpse as a zombie outweighed the benefits that it gained. In short, they were excellent meat shields but not much else. If it was a living adult wyvern, it would have presented a steep challenge for the Baroness if she were still human. He had hoped that he could gauge how much better her stats were as a revenant if the wyvern had been converted into a type of undead that didn't drastically modify its original difficulty. Since it had been zombified, however, its offensive threat had been significantly diminished and it was not much more than a punching bag. Though it would take time for her to kill, he did not believe that it would be much of a challenge for Baroness Saradnik. Oh well, at least it has a lot of HP. I'll get to see what sort of attacks she has. As the zombie wyvern clambered out of its lair, Irons decided that it looked quite impressive for such a low-level creature. The dragon-like beast was roughly 5 meters long from snout to stinger, with a wingspan of about 7 meters. The simple cottages of rural villages would be easily crushed under its weight, and people would surely flee in panic before its imposing form. Despite its cinematic style entry, the fight did not start with a bang. In fact, it did not start at all. The zombie wyvern crawled down the tower and stopped where the Baroness had wrapped her staff against the stones. Its rotting head of sickly green scales swiveled from the Baroness to Ains, then to Shultir before it just, stopped. As it stood before her motionlessly, Baroness Zaradnik frowned over at the zombie wyvern. I don't think it realizes that you're the one that made all that noise, Zaradnik Dono. The wyvern's head swiveled back to Ains, but it didn't make any aggressive movements. Like the other undead, speaking in normal tones didn't appear to draw aggro if they recognized the speaker as a fellow undead being. They're dumber than I gave them credit for, the Baroness muttered. Ma, this is what mindless means, doesn't it? She eyed the zombie wyvern's rotting neck. Shall I cut off its head, your majesty? She asked. Ains shuddered internally at her business-like tone. Once again. There was no sense of aggression whatsoever, no indication that she felt anything at all about asking what she did. A zombie it might be, but most people would express something. Just to be certain, he said, how strong is that zombie wyvern relative to yourself? It's a bit weaker than I am. Then that would be a waste. This is by far the biggest ball of hit points we've encountered, it's a good opportunity to display some of your offensive ability. Baroness Zaradnik raised a hand to scratch her cheek as if wondering what to do. After a moment, she went to tap loudly on the stone again. The zombie wyvern's head snaked around ponderously, and its jaws opened to reveal rows of decaying teeth. The Baroness easily sidestepped the attack, slashing her assailant's right eye open before retreating a dozen meters. A gurgling hiss issued from the zombie wyvern's throat, and it shambled off after her with a loping crawl. She continued her retreat over broken stones of Castle Lane, weaving deftly around the zombie wyvern's attacks while retaliating with jabs and slashes to its head. After the fourth exchange, as the zombie wyvern was recovering from its lunge, the Baroness made one of her own. Her spear split into three, lancing in from different vectors. When the points made contact with her opponent, its neck compressed like a spring and the draconic head exploded. The rest of the zombie's body flopped lifelessly to the ground. Instead of depleting its entire health pool, she had opted to destroy its head, a common weakness of low-level zombies. Eh? That's it? She's really not very flashy at all, an adventurer would at least call out their martial arts, if nothing else. Rather than cheer, pose victoriously over her vanquished adversary or anything of the sort, the Baroness examined her spear with a critical eye. Eins and Schildir walked up to join her, looking down at the body of the zombie wyvern. This is the third spear I've lost from this castle alone, Baroness Saradnik muttered. Your Majesty, how much more durable are magic weapons? If they were only slightly better, I don't think I could justify the cost. It would depend on the materials used, the skill of the crafter, 
the type of weapon and any additional reinforcements made by, say, enchantments. Compared to a mundane wooden spear, Gem, are you aware of the concept of item durability? I've heard it mentioned before, she replied, but I'm unsure of its precise workings. Think of it as a sort of health value for a piece of equipment, Ainz told her. I suppose you might be able to apply some of your common sense to it. Materials have inherent properties to them, and one of those properties is how durable the material is. In addition, materials have hardness, which you may correlate to a sort of damage reduction for items. He held out a hand towards the Baroness, and she handed over her spear. Eins raised the weapon, examining its damage as he spoke. There are different types of wood, but a wooden haft like this does not possess much in the way of hardness compared to one made of steel. To damage a weapon, you must surpass the hardness of the material used to craft it and reduce its durability. There are special attacks with sundering properties, which are specifically augmented to deal extra damage against an item's durability. These attacks are extremely effective against opponents who wield mundane equipment, since one can easily break weapons and render armor ineffective or even cause it to hamper its wearer. Ainz handed back the Baroness weapon, then withdrew the rune-crafted holy sword from his inventory. Magical equipment is effectively treated as a single component when it comes to the damage that it takes. As long as it has enough durability, it will continue to remain fully functional. Each tier of enchantment also improves the hardness and durability of an item by a specific amount, so it's not as simple as having a wooden spear half that has the durability of the entire spear backing it up. An adamantite weapon like this one is naturally twice as hard as steel, but the strength of the enchantments upon it makes it three times harder and far more durable. With this sword, one can cleave through any number of steel weapons and suits of armor without it taking a scratch. Needless to say, destroying it would be quite the feat for someone from around here. I see. I believe that I understand your explanation, your majesty, but I'll have to get a feel for how it works in practice. But you understand just how crucial it is to secure magical equipment, yes? The world I lived in was very, mundane, as you put it. Wearing brigandine layered over chainmail and a gambesine is more than sufficient to prevent damage from brigands and most tribal demi-humans. After my recent experiences, however, I've come to realize that this equipment is not as reliable as I once thought it was. The steel plates of my brigandine may as well be paper against opponents above mithril rank. Umu. Ainz put away the sword and looked down at the defeated zombie wyvern again. Normally, people wouldn't think to attack the tough and dangerous head of a wyvern, even if it was a zombie. They would instead attack its flanks, wings or try to remove its stinger before taking it down from behind. What was the attack that you used just now? I used two martial arts, the Baroness said. The first was ability boost. The second was, well, it doesn't have a name. Really? Now, he looked over at her. Adventurers tend to come up with flamboyant names for any advanced martial arts that they learn. Is there some reason why you do not? I just don't place any importance on it. Though it is unrelated, I also think that calling out one's attacks when there is no benefit in doing so is rather foolish. Her voice seemed to almost shrug as she replied. Eins wondered what she would sound like if she was telling a story. Humph, he snorted. I guess you didn't learn your martial arts from adventurers. I've received assistance with training, but all of my martial arts stem from the school of combat passed down to me by my parents. Your defensive, mobile style is due to this? Yes, your majesty. The principal style that House Zaradnik employs reflects the martial traditions and culture we've carried through the generations. I've heard that it's something from the land of my ancestors in the south. This school of combat is not one adventurers would pursue, but one used by professional soldiers. I look forward to seeing more of it, he said. For now, let's see what our friend here was guarding. Would it have been guarding anything, your majesty? Baroness Zaradnik asked. It was one of the mindless types of undead, so unless someone put it there for a specific purpose. The noblewoman had an uncanny quickness to her that seemed to invariably beat the romantic notions out of anything. Eins cleared his throat, looking up at the tower. A turn of phrase, he said. This keep seems the most likely place that we'll find anything of value, and the wyvern served as the final bosses guarding against our entry. Lord Mayor uses that sort of terminology sometimes. A chuckle rose from his throat. It conveys the idea well, yes? A little bit of spice to add to the tale of any adventure. 
Together they flew up to the top of the ruined tower. He saw that not only had the upper levels collapsed, but the floors below as well. The Baroness descended first, dispatching the remaining undead that were trapped within. Ainz looked around them as he and Chiltia floated down to join her. Like the buildings outside, the interior of the keep had been subjected to an inferno. Everything flammable had burned away, and ashes rose as he settled on the ground. It was no wonder the structure had collapsed. I don't understand, Baroness Saradnik said. It's said that these towers were ruined by battles between monsters centuries ago. What we see here doesn't suggest that. I've heard several people say the same thing, Ainz nodded. Maybe a red dragon or some other creature attributed to fire did this. Have you found anything? Nothing but ashes, the Baroness replied. There should be collapsed floors beneath us, but... Summon undead V. Four wraiths came into existence with the completion of his spell. He ordered them to see if there was anything below. Incorporeal undead are useful for tasks like this, he explained. They can pass through moderately thick obstacles, so any spaces under our feet should be accessible to them. They continued to sift through the rubble while the wraiths explored the cracks and hollows below. In the end, however, they had nothing to show for their efforts. Baroness Saradnik scanned the area one last time before they left, a furrow marring her brow. Why would anyone be so thorough in destroying every possible trace of this place's history? Maybe it's just this one castle that someone didn't like in particular, Ainz offered lightly. If I recall correctly, the next fortification should be on the Katza River? Yes, your majesty. Roughly a day's journey downstream. We'll have to walk back to where we left the ship, so that we'll add another two hours. I instructed the captain to move down a river on the way here. Our ship should be waiting for us where this river here joins with the Katza River. They headed off, following the tributary northeast. As they made their way, Ainz noted the undead that appeared out of the thickening mists remained consistently weak. It was akin to walking through the zones just outside of a starter area in Yggdrasil, but the atmosphere and their surroundings were uniformly bleak and silent. The mist itself filled his undead blessing with what was essentially static, making it impossible to distinguish where any real undead were. Rather than a low-level zone in Yggdrasil, the Katza Plains felt more like a horror setting where monsters could pop up at any time. I wonder if the strength of the undead here will change as we make our way deeper. That should be the case, your majesty, the Baroness said. The surrounding nations send adventurers, workers and army patrols to suppress the undead in the outskirts of the Katza Plains. We're only about 20 kilometers from the border of Calling County so this should be part of the area once frequented by adventurers from E. Rantel. Hmm, I suppose a possible reason for the state of that tower and its surroundings was that it was long picked clean by people coming through. After a moment's thought, the Baroness nodded. It's as likely an explanation as any, your majesty. If the collapsed tower was assumed to be cleared of all valuables, those who work here would consider it a familiar landmark of little interest. Since the accumulation of weak undead lead to the rise of stronger undead, the zombie wyvern might have manifested inside the tower, out of sight of any suppression forces passing by. Baroness Aradnik's steps slowed, and she raised a hand to call a halt to their advance. Ainz looked around, but the mist fully obscured the scenery beyond a hundred meters. Beside him, Shaltir copped an ear. With their discussion interrupted, only the sound of the wind in the current nearby could be heard. What do you see? Zarad Nikdono. Ainz asked. It's what I don't see, the Baroness answered. There haven't been any undead for the last few dozen meters. Ainz scanned the area, noting that it was indeed the case. With the interference from the mist and everything around them being so hopelessly weak, he hadn't paid the uniform variety of undead that they passed any mind. A recent patrol? He offered. Clara's patrols only clear the immediate area around her borders, Baroness Saradnik replied, but we're close enough to the theocracy that it could be won. Her voice was abruptly cut off as a tendril of water rose from the nearby tributary, snatching her leg. She vanished under the surface with a light splash. Ainz immediately recognized her attacker. Water elemental. She won't drown but, does she have a freedom item? Interposing herself between Ainz and the shore, Shiltier shook her head. She had won once, but she returned it to the person she looted it from. This is dangerous, a water elemental that can survive here can easily deal enough damage to overcome her reduction. He walked up to the edge of the water but saw no sign of the Baroness. 
Widen magic, negative burst. A wave of black radiance erupted into the area around him. He cast the spell again, then examined the surface of the water. By using the spell, he hoped that he could reach wherever the Baroness had disappeared to, healing her and harming the water elemental at the same time. Shall I retrieve her, Ein Summer? Widen magic, negative burst. A moment after the third cast, the Baroness head broke through the surface of the water. She crawled up the shore and equipped her glaive, defensively brandishing her weapon in the direction of the river. After a minute, she backed away cautiously to rejoin them. What was that thing? A water elemental. Are you all right, Zaradnik Dono? Baroness Zaradnik nodded, unequipping her glaive and retrieving a towel from her infinite haversack. I couldn't escape from it, she said, and it was damaging me quite a bit. Were you healing me, Lady Shultier? Ein Summer used negative bursts since we couldn't see where you were, Arinshu. An area of effect spell that deals negative energy damage, Ainz explained. Though it is not very potent, it's a spell that can heal the undead at the same time. Arcane casters do not have access to the Mass Inflict line of spells, so it's an efficient option for maintaining a large number of undead summons. The Baroness lowered her head. Thank you for your assistance, Your Majesty. Was the water elemental destroyed? No, Baroness Saradnik shook her head after straightening again. It retreated into the murk at the bottom of the river. Water elementals didn't take extra damage from negative energy attacks, but the fact that it had survived three of them suggested it was at least level 20. I wonder how many people have been killed by it, Eins mused as he gazed out over the water. Perhaps we should finish it off. I believe that it would be better to leave it alone. He turned back to look at the Baroness, surprised by her statement. Even though it attacked you? Even though it attacked me, she nodded. Though it is only acting according to its nature and attacking those that disturb its home, this water elemental is suppressing the undead around here. It's doing more good than harm, and it's not a threat to our subjects so far from the border. This location might even be well known, the elemental left undisturbed under the same reasoning by those who work here. Eins was once again reminded that the residents of this world did not behave like players in Yggdrasil, who only saw monsters as targets for experience and potential loot. Baroness Saradnik, in particular, appeared to have a strangely broad perspective. Was it because she was a ranger? Or was it the way that her house and its people had come to see things as residents of the frontier, surrounded by nature? In his experience, those who lived inland, urban residents especially, possessed markedly human-centric views. I see, that is an admirably pragmatic decision. You are able to see past your personal feelings to measure long-term costs and benefits. It appears that you are well suited for leadership and administration, Baroness. In that case, let's be on our way, I'd like to set sail again before dawn. They rendezvoused with their transport without further incident, but dawn did not arrive over the Katza plains. Or at least it was a dawn absent of daylight. Thirty kilometers from the nearest border, the ever-present mist had grown so thick that it choked out any trace of the sun, shrouding the land in perpetual darkness. It was commonly said that the Katza Plains was a cursed land where nothing could grow, but Eins figured that it was not the direct result of any curse, it was simply because sunlight did not reach the ground. Limited to dark vision and shrouded in the mist, visibility was no better than it had been the previous night. Zarad Nikdono, he called out to the figure standing at the bow of the ship, can you see through this mist with your true sight? The Baroness looked back, shaking her head in response. He figured that was the case, but one could never be sure in this world. When it came to the things familiar to a Yggdrasil player, there seemed to be as many differences as there were similarities. And then there was everything that did not exist in Yggdrasil, which complicated things all the more. With the lack of scenery, Eins had summoned four eighths sending them under the river's surface to look around. A gargantuan water elemental appearing to capsize the ship was decidedly undesirable. His summons periodically reported to him, describing the various undead lurking in the murk. There were even things like skeletal fish swimming around. Some sort of incorporeal undead crossed over the billowing sail, and Eins nodded to himself in satisfaction. It appeared that they were finally crossing the point where local efforts at undead suppression fell off. Now that he was here to see what it was like, it was no surprise as the vast majority of humans would become helpless if plunged into the pitch-dark environment around them. Under the canopy beside him, 
Shaltier closed her eyes and a pleasant smile filled her expression. Her chest rose in a deep breath as if she was savoring the atmosphere. Isn't this place wonderful, Ein Summer? She said, we should create something like this in the Sorcerer's Kingdom. Eins frowned internally. The closest thing they had was the Erantal Cemetery, and even that was treated as a constant source of issues by the local population. Shiltier's proposal would be overwhelmingly unpopular. That's probably not a good idea, he told her. I was going to do it eventually, but considering Countess Pauline's plans, it would be prudent to claim the Cats of Plains for the Sorceress Kingdom soon. No one else can use it anyway, so I doubt there would be any complaints if we extended our control over the area. Ma, what a wonderful idea. We could find a nice place somewhere and build a cozy lair for just the two of us. Together, we could. Shiltier's expression turned slack, and she wiped a trickle of drool from her lips. Eins idly wondered what Albedo would do if she discovered such a location. Weary of sitting in one place for hours, Eins rose to walk around the ship. Crossing under the taut sail, he made his way to the bow, wondering if a better view could be had from there. He came up behind the Baroness, watching the mist swirl around her figure. Beyond, the dark waters of the Katza River stretched out before them. How nostalgic, he half muttered to himself. Nostalgic, your majesty? Long ago, my friends and I would use ships like these to go exploring. This was mostly before we could maintain flight magic or had access to teleportation, but some places could only be reached by ship as well. Baroness Zaradnik turned at his account. Traces of her reaction to him could still be detected in her posture and expression, but she seemed to have wrestled it down for the most part. It's hard to imagine what you say, she said. For such an unfathomably wealthy and powerful ruler to be resorting to this sort of transport. It would be strange if I was always as I am now, Ions told her. In addition, I was not always a ruler. Long ago, I looked out at the world in wonder, dreaming of the possibilities that lay at its furthest reaches. I explored unknown lands, fought monsters both mighty and strange. I sought ways to learn and improve and at one point my eyes would have lit up in joy upon finding one of those weak magic items that you currently wear. That almost sounds like how the new adventurer guild markets itself. Heinz allowed himself a slight smile, crossing his arms and peering out into the mist. Well, the new adventurer guild was my idea, after all. I considered myself an adventurer once. I still do. Exploring the unknown, uncovering ancient mysteries and forgotten treasures, meeting new people and seeing new places, my appetite for these things has not waned in the slightest. When I saw that collection of bounty hunters, mercenaries and monster exterminators that called themselves adventurers, I was both saddened and incensed. I've heard that the changes to the Adventurer Guild were the result of your majesty's initiative, the Baroness said, but I wasn't aware of the reason why. Does that reason disappoint you? I, am not much of an adventurer, she admitted. The way that I think and perceive things seems to differ drastically from most of the guild's members. Is that so? You seem like quite an adventurer to me, Zerard Nickdono. The Baroness grew visibly confused over his assessment. Eins gestured to where she stood with his left hand. One of my good friends, a paladin, always stood where you are right now, looking out over the water. He was ever ready to stand between our party and the dangers that faced us, and he fancied himself a leader of sorts. He sought a path that was upright and just, pursued noble quests and went out of his way to protect the weak and oppressed. I suppose that doesn't sound much like an adventurer to you, does it? I'm afraid it doesn't, your majesty. Some adventurers claim that they work to protect the people, and some may earnestly believe this. For the most part, however, it is as you've said before. The adventurers of the old guild exchanged their power for coin, personal gain was their bottom line. Heinz leaned back on his heels, stroking his chin. Things are so different now, he said. One may as well consider what I knew to be a different world. In my time, adventurers truly adventured, but even the idea of adventuring has become alien to the adventurers here. Exploring the world, discovering new knowledge, undertaking great challenges, going on quests to save cities and nations, defeating vile foes and world-ending threats, everyone had their disparate interests, as well. He turned around, looking back across the deck. Memories of the past superimposed themselves over his surroundings. For instance, pointed to a spot near the mast. We had an alchemist who would sit right there at the bottom of the hold, making potions and consumables. 
He was very meticulous and explored the world for new alchemical knowledge and rare materials, so he'd often fall behind the party because he'd stop to pick up every herb and potentially useful material in our path. I'd be sitting with my legs dangling over the hold, researching our destination and trying to figure out what would be best for us to do. I suppose I was the sort to try and make sure things went as smoothly as possible. Pererincino San, our ranger, would be up there at the top of the mast for the best vantage and sniping position. He was the type who constantly sought to improve his capabilities, no matter how insignificant the difference. I've heard that name before, Lady Shiltier has mentioned Lord Pererincino a few times. The crimson points of his eyes travelled to the rear of the ship, where Shiltier was watching him like a hawk from the shadows of the canopy. It's not surprising that she has, Ains told her. Pererincino San is Shiltier's father and a dear friend of mine. His personality is somewhat similar to Shiltier's, but his sister usually kept him in line. I wasn't aware of that, Your Majesty, the Baroness said. Lady Yora did mention something about them being cousins, however. Ains paused at the odd definition of the relationship between the three floor guardians. Cousins? Yes, that's right. Bukubaku Shagama san is Aura and Mare's mother, as well as Perunchino san's older sister. You must be well acquainted with all of them to have learned that, Zerad Nikdono. I won't presume how well acquainted I am to them, but I have spoken with them on many occasions. Lady Yora always seems like she's out and about, but Lord Mayor comes over for dinner once in a while. The three of them appear to get along well, they act like close siblings even when they're not together. I'm happy to hear you say so, I smiled. Many misinterpret their interactions, but you have the right of things. Aura and Mare are two with whom you can entrust the knowledge of your undead state, by the way. It's not something that they would mind. Ainz returned to his seat, memories of the past and circumstances of the present intertwining in his mind. Did you hear all that, Shultier? I did, Ein Summer. I'm always gratified to learn more about the Supreme Beings, Aaron Sugar, especially Pera and Chino Summer, but to share it with the Baroness. Though not by name, this wasn't the first time I've mentioned them to others, Ainz told her. The connection of those people to us was nowhere near as significant as hers. You claim that she is an excellent, loyal vassal. Since she is undead, she'll be with you for the long term. Sharing a little about yourself goes a long way towards bringing them closer. I I see. Shiltier pulled a notepad and a pen out of her inventory, writing something down with a look of great concentration. The hours passed with only the mist and eerie stillness of the cats of planes accompanying them as their vessel plied the river. The Death Warrior captain shifted their course slightly, and the ship drew close to the northern shore. Irons went over to stand along the starboard side of the vessel, grasping the railing with a bony hand. The first sign that they were drawing close to their destination was not the appearance of a looming, broken tower in the mist, but piles of rubble along the shore. Their progress slowed as the crew carefully navigated the ship forward. An old harbour? The remains appeared to be composed of what could withstand the elements over the centuries. Their vessel drifted to a stop at the end of what looked like a stone jetty. Baroness Zaradnik disembarked first, taking point as she usually did. At least she doesn't leap off and strike some pose like Touch Me always did. If anything, she was the exact opposite, quietly observing their surroundings as she made her way forward on soundless steps like some grim spectre. Heinz and Shiltier stepped off to follow several dozen meters behind, and he took inventory of the undead all around them. Low-level undead could still be seen everywhere, but he noted stronger types amongst them. There were more of the spectral undead he had seen over the river on their way here, though they all appeared to be basic wraiths. The figures of skeleton mages, ghouls and ghasts could be seen on the streets and around the remains of the harbor's buildings. Dozens of different undead beasts were scattered about, and it all made the ruins a strange caricature of its former existence as a living settlement. Ahead of them, Baroness Saradnik knelt down to pick something up. When she turned around, he saw an undead beast cradled in her arms. The undead beast, which looked like a cross between a squirrel and a rabbit, seemed quite docile. Um, you do realize that you're holding an undead beast, right? I always thought that undead beasts all took the form of threatening animals, she said. I've never considered that there might be undead bunya. Technically, you can apply undead templates to anything, Ains told her. The rules apply no matter what you use, however, mice, squirrels and such will result in a pitifully weak zombie or skeleton or whatever it's been turned into. 
You're not thinking of keeping that as a pet, are you? No, I'm more likely to eat bunnier than keep them as pets. My people have some delicious recipes for them. Don't you dare eat that thing in front of me. Revenants don't have some flesh-eating trait like ghasts and ghouls, do they? A clump of desiccated fur came away as the Baroness gently stroked the undead beast. She made a face and put it back down. Ein suppressed a sigh of relief. It seems the idea that unsuppressed regions of the plains have stronger undead is holding out, he said. This place doesn't look like it fared any better than the previous one, though. The ruins were more like rubble, with piles of debris where many structures once stood. Baroness Saradnik continued moving forward, scanning the remains on either side of the street as she stepped around the undead. He couldn't be sure since the mist obscured his vision, but the place seemed to be at least as large as a town. If they were as thorough here in their investigation as the previous location, they could be stuck for days. He, too, was interested in unraveling the mystery surrounding the towers of Katza Plains, but examining every pebble didn't seem very efficient. There are also several other objectives on his list, and limited time to do everything. They caught up to the Baroness, who was carefully picking through the first set of buildings along the shore. Is there something in particular you're searching for? Eins asked. A cellar, the Baroness answered, or a building that looks like it held out better than the others. In that case, Eins said, how about we make things more interesting? Interesting, your majesty? Umu, he nodded. Instead of squeezing through all of these undead as we look around, how about you clear our path? You lost levels upon your return as a revenant, this appears to be a prime opportunity to get them back. 